Well, Kevin McCarthy may be the weakest and least smart man to ever serve as Speaker of the House, but it would be grotesquely unfair to call Kevin McCarthy the stupidest man who ever occupied the Speaker's office. That title goes to this guy, who was very quickly convicted by a jury today on all eight criminal counts, including four felonies that he committed while sitting in that chair. He stupidly thought he was sitting in Speaker Nancy Pelosi's chair in her office, but he was actually sitting at the desk of Emily Barrett, who served as Speaker Pelosi's director of operations and now works for House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries. After being convicted today, Richard Barnett went home to Arkansas to await sentencing after saying this outside the courthouse. This is not a jury of my peers. I don't agree with the decision. If by jury of his peers, Mr. Barnett means white Trump voters in Arkansas, then he should have not committed crimes for Donald Trump in Washington, D.C. Unfortunately for Mr. Barnett, who now faces a maximum sentence of 20 years for his felony convictions, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene cannot serve on a Washington, D.C. jury because she is a resident of Georgia. She recently said that if she had organized the January 6th attack on the Capitol, everyone, quote, would have been armed. That provoked no response from Kevin McCarthy. That was perfectly okay with him. There was a time not long ago when a member of the House of Representatives would be expelled for saying something like that, way back in the pre-Trump era of the House of Representatives. But now, in Kevin McCarthy's house, Marjorie Taylor Greene is getting rewarded after saying that. She is getting her choice of committee assignments after having been removed from committees in the last Congress when Speaker Nancy Pelosi led a bipartisan vote on the floor of the House to remove Marjorie Taylor Greene because, among other things, as the New York Times reports today, she had questioned whether a plane really flew into the Pentagon on September 11th, 2001, and endorsed the executions of Democratic politicians, including Speaker Nancy Pelosi and President Barack Obama. In that same New York Times report, Kevin McCarthy lands another entry right on the front page of the New York Times, another entry in the record books for the strangest and most stupidly phrased things ever said by a Speaker of the House. Kevin McCarthy is actually quoted in the New York Times today saying, I will never leave that woman. I will always take care of her. And he was not talking about his wife of 31 years, the mother of his two children. Kevin McCarthy can only hope that no one back home in Bakersfield, California, was reading the New York Times today because when he said, I will never leave that woman, he was talking about her. He was talking about Marjorie Taylor Greene. One of Kevin McCarthy's marriage vows in his political marriage to Marjorie Taylor Greene and other Republican extremists in the House is that he will fire Congressman Adam Schiff, Congressman Eric Swalwell, and Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. Of course, the big problem with him firing a member of Congress is the Constitution. He can't do it. What he meant when raising money on the idea that he would fire these members of Congress is that he would prevent them from serving on the Intelligence Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee. Today, the House Minority Leader, Hakeem Jeffries, struck back at Kevin McCarthy for trying to deliver vengeance to and for Marjorie Taylor Greene by knocking these three Democrats, who will join us in a moment, off of these committees. Leader Jeffries addressed the issue of the Intelligence Committee specifically because the Speaker of the House does have the final approval of that committee because it is a select committee and he has the final approval of the members of both parties of the select committee on intelligence. Leader Jeffries said in the 117th Congress two members were removed from their committee assignments after a bipartisan vote 
of the House found them unfit to serve on standing committees for directly inciting violence against their colleagues. This action was taken by both Democrats and Republicans, given the seriousness of the conduct involved, particularly in the aftermath of a violent insurrection and attack on the Capitol. It does not serve as precedent or justification for the removal of Representatives Schiff and Swalwell, given that they have never exhibited violent thoughts or behavior, at the same time that Republicans have threatened to deny seats on the Intelligence Committee to clearly qualified Democratic members, serial fraudster George Santos has been placed on two standing committees of the House and welcomed into your conference. Removing Congresswoman Omar from the House Foreign Affairs Committee would normally require a full vote of the House of Representatives and as we've seen with Kevin McCarthy's election to Speaker, winning a majority vote in the House is not easy for Kevin McCarthy. Today, Congresswoman Omar released a public letter about her committee assignments in this Congress saying, I would also be honored to continue serving on the Foreign Affairs Committee where I'd be able to continue to offer a unique perspective as a Somali American, a refugee, and the only Africa-born member of Congress. The McCarthy Three are important to Kevin McCarthy as a symbol of the kind of power he wishes he had but does not have. Nothing on Kevin McCarthy's legislative agenda will ever be signed into law by President Biden. None of it will pass the United States Senate. Kevin McCarthy will accomplish exactly nothing as Speaker of the House. Kevin McCarthy knows that. That's why the McCarthy Three are so important to him. Kevin McCarthy wants to knock these three Democrats off those committees to show Republicans the, that he can actually do something as Speaker. The Speaker wants to use the McCarthy Three as his personal fundraising tools for the next two years. No Speaker has ever reached so low to try to accomplish so little because he was incapable of accomplishing anything else. What changes on day one in the United States Senate for the Arizona seat that you would represent? What changes in the Senate in a change from Senator Sinema to Senator Gallego? Well, the first change is that, you know, the people of Arizona are actually going to have a fighter for them. I want to say a fighter for them fighting for the people that are working every day, the people that actually decide how much they make per year by hour, not by their income taxes at the end of the year, the people that have to decide between paying their utilities or paying the rents, uh, figuring out how to make ends meet, whether they're going to get generic food uh, this year or they're going to actually be able to afford maybe a little more brand name. Uh, I'm fighting for those people. Senator Simmons no longer fighting for those people, and she long ago abandoned them. And so that's the first change going to be, that every day there's going to be someone that actually is going to care about working families in Arizona. Uh, let's go to one of the big procedural questions in the Senate that uh, Senator Sinema has been very outspoken on. She really worships the 60-vote rule in the, in the Senate. Every time the 60-vote threshold is imposed, she's completely in favor of it. Uh, most Democrats, almost all the Democrats, want to get rid of it, and they want the Senate to run as a majority-run institution, 51 votes, you win. What's your position on that? Look, my position is that filibuster has to get reformed. Um, it's not a, a tool of compromise. It's a tool of, of obstruction. Look what happened after Sandy Hook. You know, dozens of, of, of children are killed, and there is no compromise. There is no comprehensive, uh, you know, gun legislation that passes, right? We have been trying to work for years and years to deal with immigration reform. We pass bills out of the House that die in the Senate. Uh, at the end of the day, this is actually really used to stop real, real movement and actual laws are actually going to help people in this country. And, you know, she talks about the filibuster as if it's some kind of great cause. When she was in Davos high-fiving Joe Manchin about, you know, killing the Voting Rights Act, she did it on MLK weekend, mm -hmm. right, on the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Uh, someone that she claims was her mentor and her best friend. So she's lost absolute trust with everybody in Arizona. 
Uh, and, and I think in general, I think she's going to have problems winning uh, any races because, you know, it's not about the filibuster. It's not about in, any particular bills. It's the fact that she just doesn't communicate and doesn't really connect anymore with the people of Arizona. So there's, there, there are two uh, jobs of, of a United States senator. One is to represent the interests of the state, and the other is to represent the interests of the nation. There are times when you're casting a vote that is a 50-state a vote, and there's times when you're casting a vote that's a very yeah. Arizona vote. There could be water rights issues, for example, that are, that, are very, that are completely controlled by your views from Arizona. What would you say are the number one Arizona issues for you and the, and the top national issues for you? Well, number one Arizona issue is, is the drought. It's affecting uh, Arizona. It's going to affect us going into the future, our growth, our, our ability to even, you know, grow food in a very uh, you know, you know, an area that's actually been, you know, the agricultural breadbasket of, of the country for many years. Uh, number two, immigration. We need to have a final Congress immigration reform bill. We've had so many opportunities at this, and it's always been politicians last minute that, you know, kind of just pull the, the football before, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Charlie's able to kick it. Uh, and lastly, uh, in general, we need to fight this despair that is out there in America. There is this general viewpoint that somehow the American dream is actually leaving uh, the hearts of most Americans. And that's just not the case. Uh, I think that we need to actually go and reinforce the economic opportunities that everyone deserves in this country to actually succeed, to like fulfill the American dream. And you have politicians that are so cynical that are actually feeding into that despair. And I don't think that that is, a, that is healthy for this country. It's one of the first, one of the only unifying things that actually connects all of Americans from, you know, the West to the East is this idea that no matter where you are, you are going to have the opportunity to succeed. There's tons of Americans who don't feel that way. And I want to make sure that we change that. Representative Swalwell, uh, the, Paul Gozar was the other Republican member who was knocked off uh, committees for similar reasons to Marjorie Taylor Greene. Uh, we have Republican uh, Congresswoman Nancy Mace tonight saying that she would not vote to remove uh, anyone uh, from a committee. And uh, that indicates that as of tonight, uh, Kevin McCarthy doesn't have all the Republican votes. And I hope that's the case uh, for Ms. Omar, because as you pointed out, her removal would require a vote on the floor. Uh, it's much easier uh, for McCarthy uh, with uh, Chairman Schiff and myself. Uh, but Lawrence, what we're seeing here is that the new McCarthy looks a lot like the old McCarthy, an individual who would abuse their political power to exact political vengeance. And in my case, uh, he's doing it under uh, you know, the fig leaf of false claims that the Washington Post uh, fact checker pointed out uh, gave him four Pinocchios, uh, and the same just as bogus for his claims about uh, Chairman Schiff and, and Ms. Omar. And so he's going to regret the day that he uh, has given me more free time, Lawrence, because I'm not going to be quiet. I'm not going to back down. I'm with Mr. Schiff and Ms. Omar in the breach. I'm going to do everything I can uh, over the next two years to hold Mr. McCarthy uh, and the people he struck this corrupt bargain with accountable, whether it's inside the House uh, or outside, uh, putting us back in the majority uh, in the midterms of 2024. Uh, Chairman Schiff, uh, as, which is your title in the last Congress, uh, what, what I know from my own experience working on two Senate committees on the staff is that uh, experience, the experienced members are invaluable. They, they bring a, an experience that is so necessary in that room. I know nothing about the workings of the Intelligence Committee, as no one who hasn't worked on it can. No one does. Uh, I can only imagine the value uh, of your experience uh, to that committee. I know you're, you're not the person who's going to come here and brag about that, but generally talk about the, the value to the Intelligence Committee of the House of experienced members. Well, uh, thank you, Lawrence. Uh, you know, by definition, prior to serving on the Intelligence Committee, you really can't know much about what that committee covers because so much of it is classified. And so I think among probably all the committees, it has among the steepest learning curve. Uh, and, and frankly, your first several months, sometimes longer than that, you're just trying to figure out what are these programs, what do these acronyms mean? Uh, you're coming to understand how the agencies work. There are a lot more of these agencies than, than you probably knew about before you're on the committee. Uh, so it is a very steep learning curve. Experience matters. 
But, you know, a big part of what McCarthy is trying to do here, it, it part, in part certainly is placating Marjorie Taylor Greene and the crazies in his conference. It's also an effort to render ineffective um, Democratic opposition to what they're doing, Democratic oversight to the abuses that are sure to come. Uh, and you're looking at members who all take their oversight responsibilities seriously. He's trying to undermine that. I agree completely uh, with Mr. Swalwell. It's not going to work. Uh, we're going to be as determined as ever with whatever platform we have to push back, to fight back, uh, to hold them accountable. And, and lastly, I just want to pick up on something that uh, Ilhan said uh, about safety. The reason these two members were thrown off their committees was because they were encouraging violence against other members. Uh, all three of us, Lawrence, have been the subject of innumerable death threats. Uh, it is a sad reality in the Trump era. Uh, and so, yes, we take security and safety very seriously because we've experienced threats to ourselves and our families. McCarthy obviously doesn't care about that. Uh, his actions are only going to accentuate the risks uh, and particularly empowering people that, uh, that encourage violence against others is exactly the wrong message. Um, and one point, if I could, uh, you know, Eric and I are in grief right now because uh, our fellow citizens in California have been gunned down now in two shootings, mass shootings, um, and, and our heart breaks for them. Um, we need to not only deal with the problem of gun violence, but we also need to deal with what we're talking about here tonight, and that is the encouragement of political violence, which is also on the rise. Representative Omar, uh you are one of the most uh, threatened members of the House in history. That's one of the reasons you were taken with Nancy Pelosi on uh, January 6th. You're not a member of the le leadership, but you needed to be uh, offered even more protection than the average member of the House that day. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, and, uh, has said recently that if she had been running that insurrection, everyone would have been armed. Uh, Kevin McCarthy obviously doesn't feel threatened, apparently, as Donald Trump didn't feel threatened uh, by the people uh, who Donald Trump incited uh, to attack the Capitol. Uh, what does it feel like for you to once again be used by Kevin McCarthy uh, to try to incite that kind of energy in Republicans who are out there watching this? Uh, it is. It's scary. Uh, I know that Eric Swalwell um, shared some of the death threats that he has been uh, getting uh, since Kevin has been public about targeting us. Um, the reason on January 6th I had the extra protection and that I, you know, the, that I had the ability to be removed with leadership was because the three months. Um, during the uh, final stages of, of the campaign, Trump chose to use my name at every single rally. Uh, and that increased the level of death threats that I was getting. And I know that um, what they're engaged in now uh, will continue to incite violence against my family and the families of um, Eric Swalwell and Adam Schiff. I do also want um, to underscore the fact that Marjorie Taylor Greene, when she was being removed, one of the reasons was that during her campaign, she held a rifle to my head and the heads of other members of Congress. She asked um, for the speaker to be hanged and said she committed treason. Uh, she came to the Capitol to harass myself and Rashida and said um, Muslims were taking over Congress, that we needed to take our oath of office on the Bible. This is someone who does, who believes that 9-11 um, was an inside job. Uh, we are not dealing with a normal, rational member of Congress. We are dealing with someone who obviously jokes about the fact that if she was leading the insurgency on January 6th, that she would have been armed. Uh, this is someone uh, who clearly thinks violence is okay, uh, someone who encourages violence, and someone who is a clear danger to myself and others in Congress.